Let's take another look at another example from the textbook. Um, so this one, we're looking at the limit of some rational function here, right? One polynomial over another. And in the textbook, you'll find a table of values. Here's x, here's f of x. So f of x, of course, being the, the function whose limit we're considering here, OK? And so you can, you can take various x values. You can plug them into the function, use your calculator, see what you get, right? Uh, and you'll find that these are some of the outputs you get. But of course, at 3, at 3, you don't actually get a result. Because if you put in x equals 3, uh, you get 0 divided by 0, OK? Division by 0 is not defined, even 0 over 0. 0 over 0 is, is this indeterminate form, right? So this is what's called a 0 over 0 limit. And an awful lot of the limits that you see in your first calculus course are of this 0 over 0 form, right? That sine x over x limit that we just looked at, that's also of this 0 over 0 form. Um, and this is, uh, this is what's known as an indeterminate form. There are a number of these that are called indeterminate forms. And, and the reason that they're um, called indeterminate is if you just think in terms of fractions for a second, right? Um, so recall that if, um, if you took a fraction of the form a over b, you wrote k equals a over b, uh, well, this means that that if I wrote a, I could write a as k times b. OK, that's fine. And as long as a and b are both non-zero integers, or even if a is 0, there, there's only going to be one k that fits this equation. right? There's only one number. So this uniquely defines some real number. k is a real number given by the form a over b. Uh, but if you tried 0 over 0, right? Or, or even, even if it's a number over 0, right? So if I did a over 0, right? Well, that would mean that a is 0 times k, right? Um, well, this is impossible if a is not 0, right? Because 0 times anything gives you 0. Uh, on the other hand, if, if you had simply 0 over 0, right, this sort of indeterminate form, well, then what that leads to is an equation that looks like 0 equals k times 0, or 0 times k, if you like, right? Um, and, and this is. So the trouble is that this is valid for any k, right? Any, any real number that you want to put into that equation, it's going to satisfy it, right? So when you see this expression 0 over 0, it's undefined because it could be anything, right? And, and so in the context of limits, if you see 0 over 0, it's this hint that you've got to do some work. You've got to go in, you've got to dig, do some investigating, try to figure out. Um, what values this function is trending towards. And the table of values certainly gives you some information. You can kind of look and see, oh yeah, heading towards 2.9 something, right? Somewhere between 2.93 and 2.94, somewhere in that neighborhood, right? 2.95 is somewhere in there. Um, but we're not quite sure. Uh, you could also ask the computer to graph it. If you ask for the graph, what you're going to find is now, not all programs will give you the vertical asymptote, but you'll find that there happens to be an asymptote for this function. Uh, there's also a horizontal one. And you'll find that the graph looks something like this, OK? Uh, there's actually another piece to it going like that. Okay? So you get something that looks um, like a hyperbola, one of these standard graphs that you might have considered in high school, except that somewhere out here, so here is say 1, 2, 3. Well, we know that the function is undefined at 3, right? So, so this isn't actually a solid graph. There's actually a hole in the graph at 3, right? And then you've got your graph for f of x. You'll get something that looks like that. Now, 
One of the things that you might be tempted to do, you might be tempted to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, something you might remember from, uh, from your algebra course is that, well, if you get zero when you plug a number into a polynomial, right, when you have a root, you know there's a corresponding factor. You know that if zero, right, if, 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 if putting x equals three produces zero, we know that x minus three is a factor, okay? And, and so one of the things you might do is you might say, hey, what happens if I factor? So if I were to factor, right, well, that top, so we're just factoring quadratics. And we know that x minus 3 is a factor because putting x equal to 3 gives me a 0. And I can work out, well, the other one has got to be a, it's got to be a 2, right? And we've got to get that minus x in the middle, so the other factor has got to be plus 2. Right. On the bottom, again, because we get 0 when we plug in x equals 3, we expect that x minus 3 is a factor. And so the other term, well, it's going to have to start with a 6x, and it's going to have to end with a 1. And you can work out that this gives you the, the right result. Okay. So when you factor, you can get a better idea of what's going on. You say, oh, look x minus 3, x minus 3, that's what's causing this 0 over 0, right? And, and so one of the things you might be tempted to do is, is cancel, right? Say cancel that x minus 3 with that other x minus 3. Go with this, right? Once the x minus 3 is gone, well then you could just plug in the x equals 3, right? This is going to give you 3 plus 2 gives you 5, right? 6 times 3 is 18 minus 1, so 5 over 17 um, seems to be maybe what this is headed towards. Uh, the trouble is that if I, if I cancel those x minus 3s and just leave this part, um, I can't actually say that it's equal to f of x anymore because once I, once I get rid of these, these two factors, I've changed the domain because the thing that's left over would be defined at 3, whereas my original function was not. Um, and again, this is where limits kind of come to the rescue because one of the things that's built into the definition of the limit is that you're considering values of x which are close to 3 but not actually equal to 3. And since you're not actually letting x equal to 3, it doesn't matter if you cancel those factors, right? Um, this function will agree with, you know, so it'll agree with this function as long as x is not equal to 3, right? And the definition of the limit kind of already says, well, x isn't equal to 3 in the limit. Um, and so that means you're allowed to make that change, and then, and then you can sort of say, okay, now it's a little bit easier to see what's going on when x is close to 3. Uh, that's the general strategy in a lot of limits, and you're going to see that a little bit later in the course.